I spend a bit too much time on Twitter, but it's often worth it because I see the most amazing stuff there, including an incredibly well executed thread by Dominic Stuckey highlighting the wonders of Xurix S10 on its s -Bahn network, which you should definitely check out, I'll link it down below. And of course it's inspired me to make this video. Now don't you worry, RM Transit has a major future covering Swiss railways, including the rest of the Zurich S-Bahn network in a future explainer video, so make sure you're subscribed down below so you don't miss that. But for now, let's take a trip over to Zurich Main Station to take a look at one of the most interesting railway lines in the world. Make sure to like this video and share it if you enjoy it. Line 10 of the Zurich S-Bahn is very, very interesting. It's not like a lot of the other Zurich S-Bahn lines in that it doesn't have double-decker trains and in that it doesn't through run like a lot of the other S-Bahn services. What it does have is a number of unique features, so let's dive into them. S10 of the Zurich S-Bahn is a line that first opened nearly 150 years ago, and it has nine stations on around 10 kilometers of track. The line is just crawling with interesting features to talk about. But what I like about it most perhaps, as with a lot of railways in Switzerland, is that it does a number of things that North American railway and transit advocates are frequently told is impossible. The first interesting part of the line is that like a lot of railway lines in Switzerland and other railway friendly nations around the world, a lot of the line is single tracked. And despite this, the services run frequently nonetheless. There's often a dogmatic attitude, especially in car-centric North America, where we are used to roads, which almost always have two lanes, and thus we too often think about railways in the same way. They must be bi-directional, and thus you must have two railway tracks. I actually think there's a common thread here worth considering, especially if you spend a lot of time or live in North America. And thus you're going to be encountering a lot of car-brained and, yes indeed, plane-brained transportation people. You see, transit agencies and indeed transportation professionals all too often are far more comfortable learning from their first-hand experiences with roads and with airports than looking at how rail and transit services work in other parts of the world. By my measure, well over half of the S10 line operates a single track, despite operating 20-minute bidirectional service at peak periods, with 10-minute service in the core urban sections of the line. The service changes from weekdays to weekends to prioritize either commuters or people taking recreational trips. Now I mentioned that most of the line operates as single track, but not that it's necessarily single track, though a lot of the line is single track. Let me explain. You see, some years ago the S10 line was extended into the city center of Zurich, to Zurich Main Station. This was alongside the S4 route, which also shares the corridor into Zurich Main Station, as well as a distinct terminal station underground at the station facility. This facility was actually built for the never actually constructed Zurich U-Bahn network. Now, quite interestingly, S4, also on the S-Bahn network, operates using AC power. Well, on the other hand, the S10 line operates on DC power, and this is because originally thoughts were that the line might eventually be integrated into the DC-powered tram network of Zurich. Since converting both routes to AC would require reconstructing a lot of infrastructure, as well as different rolling stock, it was seen as advantageous to simply operate one route as AC and the other route as DC. Now this creates a problem, since like many other railways in Switzerland, the S4 and S10 are both powered by overhead wire, and because you can't have an overhead wire that simultaneously provides AC and DC power, so instead the tracks carrying S4 and S10 instead have two catenary wires. The AC catenary is in the regular position, above the center of the track, while the DC catenary is slightly offset. This means that the trains operating on S10 need to have this funky off-center pantograph that kind of looks like that the cat that goes like this, but it's a pantograph. Now, in most cases in North America, this would be seen as totally unworkable, and one line would probably have been cut back to the branch point of both services. But in Switzerland, the solution of using one DC wire and one AC wire is seen as acceptable. It also has the benefit of reducing the cost of converting the S10 line to AC and providing direct downtown core service to both lines. A real life instantiation, if you will, of the commonly touted organization before electronics, before concrete mantra that drives railway planning in Switzerland. 
Now, as I said before, the line is operated as a single track railway. So how does that work? As is only natural, the tracks into Zurich main station for the S10 and S4 are dual track so that eventual conversion to AC is possible. But since a two wire solution is used, the S10 service is basically deprioritized and thus it must mostly use the tunnels into Zurich main station as single track. That's because to keep things simple, the AC and DC catenary wires can't cross. That means that having two tracks afforded to the S10 within the tunnel means only affording one track to the S4 and vice versa. And that means that since the S4 is higher priority, it receives two tracks for almost the entire tunnel while the S10 receives just one. One that is except for a single passing loop just outside of Saunau station between that station and Zurich main. Now, it shouldn't be lost on you how cool this section of tunnel that brings the S4 and S10 into central Zurich actually is, as it mostly runs under the river seal, with the entrance at Selnau acting sort of like the Canary Wharf Crossrail station, in that it's built in a waterway, but the station itself is underground, and so the boat-like entrance to the station cuts through the water's flows. Now, leaving the tunnel that takes you to Selnau and Zurich Main Station, you have a very cool tunnel portal, which is integrated directly into a building built above it. Now, this actually used to be the terminus of the line before the extension into Zurich was built. From here, the line runs alongside the river before cutting under the dead end of the A3 motorway that is built elevated above the river, which is actually a pretty common way to build elevated transportation infrastructure. It also does go to show that nowhere, and I mean nowhere, escaped the scourge of elevated freeways. Now, from here on, what's actually interesting is that if you thought it was strange enough that the line goes under a river and has weird catenary and pantograph off to the side, you might be correct, but you might also not be because the rest of this line climbs a mountain. The western end of the S10 line, after spending its time as an urban rail line, and after spending some time again as a suburban rail line, goes on to be a full-blown mountain railway, with one of the steepest non-rack railway lines in Europe, at nearly an 8% grade. After leaving the Trimley station, the line begins a winding and looping path all the way to the summit of Mount Utliberg. In North America, getting to nature almost always involves getting in a car. Sure, there are a few nice parks here and there accessible by rail or by rapid transit systems or a bus, but most national parks and truly wild areas are really only open to people who are willing to drive. Fortunately, this isn't as much of a problem in Europe and in Switzerland in particular, where mountain railways are a dime a dozen, where they often go to places where you can't even access by car and where they sometimes even go direct to the downtown terminal every 20 minutes on the weekend. Allowing people to access places like this by rail isn't just good for the natural environment, but it's also more affordable and accessible and equitable than car-based access. It also does much less damage to those special places than car parking and the like. And changes in the air. Zurich being the transit-friendly place that it is, S10 is getting an upgrade. While the dual mode running meant a lower cost solution running for the long term, and that meant avoiding concrete, infrastructure changes are now being made but they still don't involve much concrete because they're mainly electronic. In order to increase capacity and the frequency of trains in these central core tunnels, the S10 has received trains which are compatible with both AC and DC power. This will allow the central core of the railway, which is shared between S4 and S10, to operate in a more conventional way, being fully converted over to AC power along with the rest of the S10 route. Since the older trains weren't quite ready for retirement, when new trains were ordered from Statler, they were actually designed with a pantograph that could move back and forth to allow for both DC and AC power to be accepted. That means that now that the older trains are ready for retirement, the line can properly be converted over for AC power and trains can be moved back and forth between the S4 and S10 routes. I hope if anything, the S10 has shown you that a lot is possible if delivering a high quality transit experience is your number one priority. And with that, even challenges with infrastructure and the physical environment aren't necessarily insurmountable. Thanks for watching.